Welcome to Too Fond of Books. My name is Janelle and this is a library haul. I have 11 books here that I've just gotten out from the library and I thought why not share them with you. I use my library all the time. I love my library and I love that they're doing what they can to stay open and available to people even during lockdown. So our city is currently in another lockdown. The libraries are closed but you can still put books on hold and then um, get them at a curbside pickup. Um, so that's what I've done for these and so why don't I just show you what's caught my eye at the library. First up, this is a book that I heard about from Kate Howe's channel. This is The Body in the Garden by Katherine Shellman. This is a Lily Adler mystery, perfect for fans of Tasha Alexander and Reese Bowen. This is her debut novel published in 2020. London 1815. Though newly widowed, Lily Adler is returning to a society that frowns on independent women. She is determined to create a meaningful life for herself even without a husband. She's no stranger to the glittering world of London's upper crust. At a ball thrown by her oldest friend, Lady Walter, she expects the scandal, gossip, and secrets. What she doesn't expect is the dead body in Lady Walter's garden. So yeah, <laughs> that just sounded really good. All right, and then this is Death at the Country Mansion by Louise R. Eines. Now, I can't remember where I saw this. This is a Daisy Thorne mystery. This is a cozy, it certainly looks like a cozy, set in the UK. Welcome to Daisy Thorne's Ooh La La hair salon in the charming village of Edgemead in Surrey, England, where you'll find the latest styles, the juiciest gossip, and the most tantalizing murder clues. No one would ever accuse famous opera star Dame Serena Levante of lacking a flair for the dramatic. Unfortunately, it's curtains down on the dysfunctional diva when she's found dead at the bottom of a staircase in her elegant home. Solving an opera singer's murder may not be the typical hairdresser's aria of expertise. <laughs> Do you see what they did there? Very punny. Uh, but Dame Serena was the mother of Daisy's best friend, Floria. So Daisy must do or die, they did it again, D-Y-E, her best to get to the roots of the case. Oh my goodness, this is packed with... <laughs> this is totally a cozy. Even though the gruff but handsome Detective Inspector Paul McGinnis tells the stylist to stay out of his hair, Daisy is determined to make sure the killer faces a stern makeover behind bars. <laughs> okay, this book was worth getting out of the library just for the synopsis on the back. Oh my goodness, that is so funny. Uh, so the author herself lives in Surrey, uh, where she is setting her, her book. <laughs> That was hilarious. <laughs> okay, this is Death of an Obnoxious Tourist by Maria Hud Hudgen Hudgens. This is the first in a series as well. All right, Dotsy Lamb. History professor and recently divorced empty nester and her friend Letty are on a group tour of Italy when a singularly obnoxious woman traveling with her two younger sisters is murdered in her Florence hotel room. Dotsy enlists the aid of the scatty but observant Letty and hooks up with Marco Quattrochi, the attractive carabinieri, sorry, <laughs> captain in charge of the investigation. The killer might have been a member of their tour group or a gypsy camped nearby, or one of four people date Dotsie had met since her arrival. There are motives galore. The murdered tourist has insulted practically everyone in the tour group, her two sisters are left with a nice inheritance, and she may have had a drug connection to the fiancé of the tour guide. Mmm. Yeah. Okay, and then this is The Vanished Bride by Bella Ellis. This is a Bronte sisters mystery, which intrigued me. Before they became legendary writers, Charlotte, Emily, and Anne Bronte were detectors. Yorkshire, 1845. A young wife and mother has gone missing from her home, leaving behind two small children and a large pool of blood. Just a few miles away, a humble parson's daughters, the humble, humble, 
A humble Parsons' daughters, the Bronte sisters, learn of the crime. Charlotte, Emily, and Anne Bronte are horrified and intrigued by the mysterious disappearance. These three creative, energetic, and resourceful women quickly realize that they have all the skills required to make for excellent lady detectors. <laughs> I always think it's funny whenever they put the, the word lady in front of any kind of a job. It's, I find that so funny. Uh, not yet published novelists, they have well-honed imaginations and are expert readers. And, as Charlotte remarks, detecting is reading between the lines. It's seeing what is not there. As they investigate, Charlotte, Emily, and Anne are confronted with a society that believes a woman's place is in the home, not scouring the countryside looking for clues. But nothing will stop the sisters from discovering what happened to the vanished bride, even as they find their own lives are in great peril. Yeah, who doesn't want a historical mystery about the Bronte sisters? This came out in 2019. Okay, and then we also have another new book. This is The Kitchen Front by Jennifer Ryan. Now, I have read The Spies of Schilling Lane, um, which I enjoyed. And so this is, again, historical fiction. Two years into World War II, Britain is feeling her losses. The Nazis have won battles, the Blitz has destroyed cities, and U-boats have cut off the supply of food. In an effort to help housewives with food rationing, a BBC radio program called The Kitchen Front is holding a cooking contest, and the grand prize is a job as the program's first ever female co-host. For four very different women, winning the competition could present a crucial change chance to change their lives. For a young widow, it's a chance to pay off her husband's debts and keep a roof over her children's heads. For a kitchen maid, it's a chance to leave servitude and find freedom. For a wealthy, for a lady of the manor, it's a chance to escape her wealthy husband's increasingly hostile behavior. And for a trained chef, it's a chance to challenge the men at the top of her profession. These four women are giving the competition their all, even if that means sometimes means bending the rules. But with so much at stake, will the contest that aims to bring the community together only serve to break it apart? This sounds really, really good, really interesting. This came out just this year, 2021. And then finally, The Confidence Game by Maria Konnikova. Now this book was recommended to me in the comments of my Smoke and Mirrors Day, National Smoke and Mirrors Day video that I put out for March Mystery Madness. Um, Inking Your Thinking recommended this. This is uh, nonfiction. And in that video, I, I talked about some books that were about um, con artists. And this is a nonfiction book about con artists, why we fall for it every time. It just sounds really interesting. While cheats and swindlers may be a dime a dozen, true con men, the Bertie Madoffs, the Jim Bakers, the Lance Armstrongs, are elegant, outsized personalities, artists of persuasions, and exploiters of trust. How do they do it? Why are they successful? And what keeps us falling for it? The author, now she turns to some of the greatest criminals in actual history in an entertaining and highly enlightening tour through the minds, motives, and methods behind their craftiest cons. The confidence game not only asks why we believe con artists, it also examines the very act of believing and how our sense of truth can be manipulated by those around us, leaving us to fall for it over and over again. Really interesting. So thank you very much, Inking Your Thinking, for recommending that book to me. I'm really looking forward to getting into it. Okay, then we have Mrs. Moore Goes Missing by... Sorry, the name is covered by stickers. The library loves to do that. Mary, Marila, I am completely going to butcher this name. I'm really sorry. I'm going to actually put it on the screen here for you so that uh, you can see. Marila Szymanskowa. Sorry, this has been translated from the Polish by Antonia Lloyd Jones. And this is a Zofia Turbotnitsky Nitska mystery. Okay, so we're in Krakow in 1893. Zofia, professor's wife and socialite, is bored at home with little to do besides planning a charity auction sponsored by the wealthy residents of a local nursing home and the nuns who work there. 
but when one of those residents is found dead, Zofia finds a calling, solving crimes. Ridiculed by the police who have declared the death of natural causes, she starts her own murder investigation, unbeknownst to anyone but her loyal cook, Franziska, and one reluctant nun. With her husband blissfully unaware of her secret, uh, Zofia remakes herself into Krakow's greatest, or at the very least, most surprising amateur detective. Inspired by the works of Agatha Christie and full of period character and charm, Mrs. Moore Goes Missing proves that everyone is capable of finding their passion in life, no matter how unlikely it may seem. So yeah, I can't remember where I discovered that one either, but yeah, it sounds interesting. Let's see when this was published. Published in, um, first published in 2015, English translation copyright 2020. Okay, and then we have The Plea by Steve Cavanaugh. This is the next up in the um, Eddie Flynn series. I just read the first one, The Defense, and loved it so much that I immediately had to get the second one. And I'm not going to um, tell you about this one uh, because I don't want to give anything away. It's the second one in the series, but I love it. It's set in New York, and Eddie Flynn is a con artist turned lawyer. All right, and then we have A Royal Affair by Alison Montclair. This is the second in her Sparks and Bainbridge series. I just read the first of this one as well, and this is a historical mystery series set in London immediately following World War II, and Sparks and Bainbridge um, are running a marriage bureau. So in this one, it's 1946. As the country goes about the business of rebuilding after the Second World War, the proprietors of the Right Sort Marriage Bureau are doing their part both personally and professionally. The fledgling agency owned by Irish Sparks and Gwendolyn Bainbridge has had some success and achieved some small notoriety, but it's their backgrounds and family connections that bring a member of the royal household to their door. Lady Matheson, a cousin of Gwen's, works for the Queen in some capacity <laughs> and is in need of some discreet investigation. It seems that Princess Elizabeth has developed feelings for a dashing foreign prince who might have skeletons in his closet. To this end, a blackmail note has arrived at the palace alluding to some potentially damaging information about said prince. Wanting to keep this out of the palace gossip circles, but also needing to find out what skeletons might lurk in the prince's closet, the palace has quietly turned to Gwen and Iris. Without causing a stir, the two of them must now find out what secrets lurk in the prince's past before his engagement to the future Queen of England is announced. But what's one misstep could end in a deadly royal affair. All right, and then I heard about this book um, from Krista's channel, Books and Jams. This is The Librarian of Boone's Hollow by Kim Vogel Sawyer. I've never read anything by this author, but this book is about the Pack Horse Librarian Project in Kentucky, which I am really intrigued by. I read The Book Woman of Troublesome Creek um, and The Giver of Stars, and I just really enjoyed learning a little bit more about that project. And so this is also set during the Great Depression, city dweller A.D. Cowherd dreams of becoming a novelist and offering readers the escape that books had given her during her tragic childhood. When her father loses his job, she is forced to take the only employment she can, delivering books on horseback to impoverished coal mining families in the hills of Kentucky. But turning a new page will be nearly impossible in Boone's Hollow, where residents are steeped in superstitions and deeply suspicious of outsiders. Even local Emmett Th Tharp, the first in his family to graduate college, feels the sting of rejection after returning to the tiny mountain hamlet. And as the crippled economy leaves many men jobless, he fears his degree won't be worth much in a place where most men either work the coal mine or run moonshine. As Addie also struggles to find her place, she'll unearth the truth about a decades-old rivalry. When someone sets out to sabotage the town's library program, will the culprit chase Edie away or straighten to the arms of the only person who can help her put a broken community back together? So yeah, that's a part of history in the States that I'm just so interested in, um, so I'm happy to read another book about it. 
And then finally, this is Shakespeare, The Invention of the Human by Harold Bloom. Now, um, we have a book by Harold Bloom called How to Read and Why. So Harold Bloom is a professor in the States, um, I forget where, but this one is a massive work about Shakespeare. In this landmark work, the culmination of a lifetime of reading, writing about, and teaching Shakespeare, Harold Bloom once again demonstrates that he is the preeminent literary critic of our time. Shakespeare, The Invention of the Human is an expansive, hugely ambitious, passionate, and convincing analysis of the central work of the Western canon and of the playwright who not only invented the English language, but also, as Bloom argues, created human nature as we know it today. Before Shakespeare, there was characterization. After Shakespeare, there were characters, men and women capable of change with highly individual personalities. Bloom leads us through a comprehensive reading of every one of Shakespeare's plays, beginning with the original, or Ur Hamlet, which against current scholarship he attributes to Shakespeare, and ending with Shakespeare's mysterious abandonment of his art after the two no noble kinsmen. He charts each breakthrough in human characterization, starting with Falconbridge, the Bastard, and King John, Mercutio in Romeo and Juliet, and Bottom in A Midsummer Night's Dream, and culminating in the unrivaled creations of Falstaff, Hamlet, Iago, Cleopatra, Macbeth, Rosalind, and Lear. As we are made aware of the distinctive features of Shakespeare's most fully realized characters, Falstaff's wit, Hamlet's extraordinary intellect, Macbeth's proleptic imagination, Lear's capacity for love, Cleopatra's the theatricality, Iago's genius for writing with the lives of others. We come to sense Shakespeare's own obsessions, and an insightful and deeply moving portrait emerges of the enigmatic playwright who Bloom maintains created us. Shakespeare, The Invention of the Human, is a brilliant companion to Shakespeare's work and just as much an inquiry into what it means to be human. It explains why Shakespeare has remained our most popular and universal dramatist for more than four centuries, and in helping us to better understand ourselves through Shakespeare, it restores the role of the literary critic to one of central importance in our culture. Harold Bloom is Sterling Professor of Humanities at Yale University, Berg Professor of English at New York University, and a farmer, former Charles Eliot Norton Professor at Harvard. So this book is actually um, more than 20 years old. It's uh, from 1998, um, but I'm really excited to delve into that. It's a, it's a, it's a chunker, but I find it um, fascinating. So there you have it. Those are the 11 books that I have just recently gotten from the library. Have you read any of these books? Do you suggest that I start uh, somewhere? Where do you suggest that I start? Um, do any of these books sound intriguing to you and uh, are books that you would like to check out yourself? Uh, let me know in the comment section down below and I will see you for another video soon. Bye.